Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. I'm Jean Deville, joined as always by my co-host, Blaine Curcio. This week, we bring you the latest launch updates of the CCAF, the China Commercial Aerospace Forum, and definitely there were quite a few impressive updates. Let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So the China Commercial Aerospace Forum, or CCAF, is an important conference hosted every year in Wuhan since 2015. There were keynote speeches, you have thematic roundtables, and you also have exhibitions. And it's really a great place to sort of get the latest updates on China's commercial space ecosystem. And this edition, once again, did not disappoint. And so first big news, iSpace, one of the leading Chinese commercial launch companies and the first commercial company to have put a payload into orbit in 2019 in China, showed an impressive enthusiasm at the Forum for Space Tourism. And we had already vaguely seen a sort of a space plane with windows concept in some of their previous marketing material. But this time, iSpace's entire keynote speech at CCAF was dedicated to space tourism, which does suggest that Space tourism is really on the roadmap rather than just sort of a marketing stunt on a PowerPoint. And so first and foremost, it seems that iSpace is developing a rocket and a capsule for suborbital space tourism. And this project apparently will not start from scratch. We know that the company is already developing something called the Hyperbola 2Z. And this is basically a vertical takeoff, vertical landing prototype for their upcoming Hyperbola 2 reusable medium lift launch vehicle. And the Hyperbola 2Z basically is the first stage of a Hyperbola 2, and that is to be used as a prototype to perform hops to learn how to do vertical takeoff, vertical landing, similar to what Deep Blue Aerospace has been doing with the Nebula M, and similar to what SpaceX did with the Grasshopper in the early 2010s. But apparently, according to this keynote speech at CCAF, iSpace plans to derive the Hyperbola 2Z into a single-stage rocket, which would launch a crewed capsule, and this capsule would then follow a suborbital trajectory before landing on Earth using parachutes. And this probably rings a bell because it's very similar to a project that was announced by Caspace a couple of months ago that we mentioned on the Dongfang Hour, as well as, obviously, the Blue Origin New Shepard. So that's the first project of iSpace. There's another one that's probably the most ambitious one, and which is in the continuity of the so-called space plane with windows that we had seen previously on their marketing material. And so at the conference, iSpace mentioned that they would develop such a second stage space plane initially for suborbital space tourism, probably with greater capacity and capabilities than the previously mentioned crewed capsule and the single stage rocket, probably also because um, this space plane will be launched on board the Hyperbola 3, which is iSpace's future heavy lift launch vehicle. And perhaps even more interestingly, this space plane apparently will be upgraded in the future into something that will enable orbital space tourism, as well as point to point space transportation. So apparently there's a new commercial player in town that is uh, looking into developing space tourism. And this is probably the probably the third serious looking contender in China for space tourism after Caspace, which is developing something similar to the Blue Origin New Shepard called the ZK-6 and also space transportation or Lin Kong Tianxin, which is going more the suborbital space plane route. Now, of course, when we have this kind of announcement, the question for us is always, you know, is there a market for uh, that many players, three players for suborbital space tourism, that's already um, quite a lot. And the second question, which is perhaps more China specific, is that is there really a big market in China for suborbital space tourism? And that's because um, we're today in a political environment that has developed over the past few years where the rich tend to maybe lay a bit lower or at least not display very ostentatiously their wealth. And um, that's, you know, Definitely, I think that suborbital space tourism is a pretty bling thing to do, and so, um, and so, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a question that remains open. And speaking of space planes, there was some additional space plane news that was revealed at the CCAF, and notably, Kasich announced that their Tungyun spacecraft, which is a two stage to orbit horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing space plane, had already successfully performed a first so called cycle switching 
test flight. And if this is true, this would be an absolute breakthrough as this kind of space plane that uses turbine-based combined cycle engines is really cutting edge technology. Now, as far as I know, outside of China, there's only one other company that's developing this kind of technology, which is Reaction Engines Limited in, um, in the UK. Now, I would note that we have no real images of the flight or of the flight hardware, so I don't know how real this update is. And I think this is quite a pity because this uh, this project was marketed as, as a civil program, and yet it is still absolutely secretive. And at the CCAF, separately, there was also another discussion on another space plane, and this time on a single stage to orbit spacecraft project using RBCC, so rocket-based combined cycle engines. And there was also a description of the associated roadmap and the associated technologies as well, including thermal protection technology. And so this is another space plane that seems different from Tangyun, which is a two-stage to orbit space plane, while uh, this other unnamed space plane is a single stage to orbit. They also seem to have different roadmaps. Tangyun is aiming initially for an entry in service in 2030, while this unnamed single stage to orbit spacecraft is looking more at 2035. Both seem to be crewed. Apparently, this single stage to orbit spacecraft would carry four passengers. Tung Yun, we don't really know, but we've seen videos and marketing material that show passengers getting on board Tung Yun. So um, that's starting to be a lot of space planes for China. But um, yeah, Blaine, anything to add on these uh, these projects or shall we go back to more classical launch vehicles? Just a couple of points. So to your earlier point about space tourism, indeed, I would argue that, you know, nothing says common prosperity like, you know, rich people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a 15 minute space flight. So yeah, a little bit surprising to see this kind of emphasis. And also just one other point in regard to Tung Yun, uh, I would note that it was one of Kasich's, uh, I suppose, formerly five clouds projects, although we may now call them four clouds potentially, because again, my feeling is that Hong Yun is, uh, is no longer no longer on the table. So um, these five clouds, it was a very large initiative from a handful of years ago, and they were talking about investing 100 billion RMB into these five projects. So it's interesting to see that a couple of these projects have seemingly made more progress than others, although probably not so surprising. Getting over to a couple more commercial launch updates. So we saw some updates from the company Deep Blue Aerospace, who announced their, uh, well, they, they showed their Nebula 1, which we had already heard about. But then they also interestingly announced a Nebula 1H, which we take to mean Nebula 1 Heavy. And this is a departure from their previous plan of having an expendable Nebula 1 rocket and then a reusable Nebula 2 rocket. Now, we don't necessarily know how the payload of the Nebula 1H compares to the Nebula 2 but I would mention that the Nebula 2 was itself a pretty big rocket with a payload of five tons to LEO if it were reusable and six tons to LEO if it were expendable. And notably, Deep Blue Aerospace had previously described the Nebula 2 as a medium lift rocket. And again, we can assume perhaps you know, that the Nebula 1H is a heavy lift rocket. So we may assume that the Nebula 1H has a larger payload than you know, five or six tons, which makes it a very big rocket indeed. And it's a little bit speculative here, but I suspect that the heavier rocket may be an indication of increased policy support for commercial launch vehicles. And that is to say, previously, most of the commercial launch companies were developing rather small rockets, probably also because they were earlier stage, but I think probably partly because a larger rocket is more directly competitive with players like the Long March, notably. And so again, seeing these commercial launch companies building bigger rockets and announcing bigger rockets that look you know, rather more of the scale of some of the Long March, it, it may be an indication that um, we're seeing more policy support for commercial launch. And indeed, given the number of launch companies that we continue to see spring up, that's probably true. And last point on Deep Blue Aerospace, we did see them increase the expected payload from 500 kilograms sun synchronous orbit to a rather robust one ton. And so we now have, uh, again, a couple of pretty big rockets being developed by Deep Blue Aerospace. Uh, so, Sean, unless you have anything else on DBA, we have a couple more launch companies that gave mm. some pretty significant updates because this is China and we cannot use all of our fingers and toes to count the number of launch companies. There are more than that. Yeah, and just just to your last point on Deep Blue Aerospace, definitely it's, a, it's really a reshuffle of their initial strategy because, as you mentioned, they're increasing the payload of the initial Nebula 1. It used to be an expendable mm. rocket. It now looks like it'll be a reusable rocket. And they also went mm. for a modular architecture where it seems that the Nebula 1 Heavy is sort of 
well, a Nebula 1, where you add two additional first stages. Lose threat, yeah. So uh, definitely yeah. a big change for Deep Blue Aerospace. And as you said, definitely sure. also not the only other company that has been uh, making big launch announcements at the CCAF. Another interesting update comes from a rather stealthy company that goes by the name of Space Trek or Xintu Tansu. And this company was founded in 2015. It has um, founders that I think have some military background. And this startup has had on the roadmap two rockets. You have the suborbital single stage solid field Tanswell one, which made a maiden flight in December 2019, although I think that they haven't flown um, since as far as I know. And you also have a small lift solid field rocket called the Shingtu one, which would be able to put 240 kilograms into sun synchronous orbit. Um, so nothing new there so far. And the Shingtu one has not flown yet, but apparently the company has even bigger ambitions with a presentation at the CCAF showing a 3.35 meter diameter reusable launch vehicle that would be able to put three tons into low Earth orbit. We don't really have a name for this new rocket, but it's a very similar rocket to competitors now like the Landspace ZQ-2, the iSpace Hyperbola 2, the Galactic Energy Palace 1, the DBA Nebula 1, and just to name a few of the contenders, but you have many more. I haven't mentioned Orion Space, Space Pioneer, or Cast Space, and, and some of the others. So um, yeah, Space Trek looking at medium lift launch vehicles. It seems like this segment of the market is getting very crowded as well. Um, and it seems like every other month we have a new player trying to get into uh, into this market. And speaking of that, actually, there's another company that's based in Xi'an called AA Engine uh, or Kongtian Inqing, which was known as an engine manufacturer. They make Carolox engines and hypergolic fuel engines for rockets and for other spacecraft as well as engine parts such as valves, pumps, and combustion engines. And interestingly, at the CCAF, they also showcased two liquid-fueled rockets, which are called the AX-1 and the AX-11. And these look like small lift and medium lift launch vehicles. And so, um, unfortunately, not much more is known because it wasn't really a keynote presentation, but more just of a poster that was on the online exhibition of the CCAF. But, uh, you know, we're seeing a, an engine manufacturer deciding to provide an end-to-end -end offer and to build rockets themselves. So um, that's definitely a new phenomenon in the commercial market in China. And uh, yeah, Blaine, any, any other thoughts on these two new players or? Yeah, I guess my only question is uh, when should we expect to see Jiuzhou Yunjian announce their own systems level rocket? Because of course they are a company that is primarily or entirely focused on developing rocket engines. But um, as we found with AA engine, uh, that is not necessarily- uh, It's not enough. They can always pivot. Um, so yeah, getting into our last launch company, uh, XSpace, which is arguably the most significant at this conference, given their connection with Kasich. So XSpace, of course, is a commercial subsidiary of the Sanjiang Group, which again is a subsidiary of Kasich. So they are well-funded. They have some technology transfer probably from Kasich, and they have up to this point developed a fairly successful series of solid launch vehicles, notably the Quadro 1 and more, uh, more commonly Quadro 1A. And so we heard from XSpace during the conference that they plan to launch seven Quadro 1A rockets in the next three months, which is an indication, I think, that the company is getting into a bit of a production groove. This coming after a launch failure about a year and four months ago, and they have now had three successful launches over these last couple of months. So again, we had about a one year absence from XSpace where they weren't really talking about anything, um, but about three, four months ago, they had a successful return to flight of the Quadro 1A. They've since had two more successful missions. And again, they plan for seven missions over the next three months. And I would also point out that we did hear uh, last year at the CCAF from uh, fellow Kasich subsidiary Leobit Technologies, which is the operating company for Xinyun, that they plan to launch 12 Xinyun satellites. At the time, they were saying 2021, now more likely 2022. But notably, those will be on Quadro 11 rockets, which is Kasich's yet to be successfully launched medium lift rocket. And so what that can really tell us is that the other seven Quadro 1A launches over these next few months are not going to be launching Xinyun satellites. And so they may very well be launching commercial satellites. They may also be launching um, you know, government satellites. And indeed, earlier this week, we did see for the first time, as far as I know, a large government payload launched on a Quadro 1A with the Shiyan 11 satellite, which was, again, an example of a non-commercial launch from the Quadro 1A. So seven launches of the Quadro 1A coming up, and it will be very interesting to see what those payloads are. And we also did hear during the conference 
that the Wuhan Aerospace Industrial Base now has a production capacity of 20 Quadro rockets per year, which is something that Kasich has been discussing for some time, and it's interesting to now see that come to fruition. A couple of final updates that we saw from, from X-Space. Um, a slide that showed a mysterious medium-heavy solid-fueled rocket, which we may take to be the Quadro 21 or potentially the Quadro 31, but again, did not have a name on this slide, but definitely an interesting thing to see. And other than that, I don't have any other updates on uh, on X-Space. So, um, John, anything from your side on X-Space, or do you want to take us to uh, the final launch company of uh, of the week? Yeah, Landspace. Landspace is considered to be one of the most advanced Chinese commercial launch companies. They're currently developing the Jutria 2 medium lift liquid fueled methlox rocket, which can put four tons into low Earth orbit. And they're a company from whom we've had regular updates over the past few years, although they've been relatively quiet in 2021. And before getting into the piece of news, just a quick recap of what they've been doing. They did a number of cryogenic plumbing system tests earlier this year. They also assembled four TQ-12 engines on a first stage, the TQ-12 being the 80-ton thrust methlox engines that will power their first stage of the ZQ-2 rocket. They also completed the first phase of the construction of their Jashing rocket manufacturing facility that manufactures the ZQ-2. And prior to that, in 2020, they also did a number of important engine tests with some very nice footage that's available on the internet. And perhaps most of interest over the past few weeks, we also saw a fully assembled ZQ-2 at the coastal spaceport of Haiyang a couple of weeks ago on satellite images, and which seems to suggest, well, you know, seeing a fully assembled ZQ-2, that this ZQ-2 is moving forward quite well. And I believe that Roger Zhang, the CEO of Landspace, also mentioned a few days ago that the ZQ-2 is moving forward pretty well. It will be fully assembled by the end of 2021 and that it will launch in the first part of 2022. So back to the CCAF and land space, there was no big scoop. They did show during a keynote speech the ZQ-2 rocket in a heavy version, and perhaps more significantly, they showed the first stage of the ZQ-2 performing vertical landing. And this is notable because the ZQ-2 has always been said by land space to be a first expendable rocket, but that it would be made reusable in a second phase. And there was always some skepticism about this statement, considering that this rocket has adopted a four engine layout. And this is very different from the other Chinese commercial launch vehicles that have gone for a more of a star shaped cluster of engines, which makes vertical landing significantly easier. And so I mean, for the ZQ-2 to perform vertical landing, it would have to ignite one of its engines during the landing process. This engine would have to throttle very significantly. And the fact that they went for a four engine layout means that the engine that would be reignited would be a little bit offset. And so that's uh, an additional challenge in terms of keeping the, um, the, the rocket stable. But mm. again, I think the news here is that they showed the ZQ-2 during the keynote performing a vertical landing, which does suggest that, um, you know, they... They plan to move forward with that and that reusability is definitely still on their roadmap. So um, I think that's uh, that's about it for land space. Just a, a short but interesting update. And uh, Blaine, I'll let you wrap up this episode. Sure thing. So just one last update to discuss from the CCAF this week. We did see uh, Liu Shuquan during his keynote speech say that Kasich plans to launch at least 12 satellites in 2022. And it's not it was not explicitly stated as far as I could tell, but it seems fairly likely that those 12 satellites will be part of the Xingyun narrowband constellation. That being the case, there was a separate sub-forum on satellite manufacturing, which we have yet to really dig into. And so next week, we will be having a second CCAF episode covering all of the satellite manufacturing updates. There are sure to be quite a number of them. That being said, um, just a couple of housekeeping items to wrap up the episode. We would first like to send a special shout out and thanks to our good friends at GoTikonauts and Spacewatch.Global, two great sources of space industry news. We also are happy to announce that we have recently set up a Buy Me A Coffee page. So if you go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash Hour, you can indeed buy us a coffee or help pay for future uh, equipment or further research into episodes or any other nice things that uh, that involve the Chinese space sector and reporting on it. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always with my co-host Jean Deville, and uh, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. Thanks for listening. Thank you for watching and see you next week.